Chapter 10 Land ho! The lookout cried from the crow's nest. All hands on deck! Captain Tom shouted. At last, the fog cleared and both the blue buccaneers and their guests bounced on their toes, elated to see the sun again. The hornswaggle emerged from clouds that hugged the surface of the hazy sea into a brilliant blue sky. Ahead, they could see the waves cresting on a beach, as well as a wall of greenery. As the sails were stashed away and the balloons inflated to lift the ship up out of the water into the air, pelicans flew alongside the hull. George barked at them in greeting. Although she was enjoying herself, the baby dragon looked around when she realized something was missing. Captain Tom, Tanith called. The song said there was a kraken in these waters, yet we are fast approaching the end of the sea. Where is it? The captain threw back his head and laughed, long and loud and joyful. That scoundrel, he said fondly. There are no more shipwrecks because of him. He has long since picked up his tentacles and shuffled his way to the ocean. Some say he marooned himself in the desert on his way there, but I believe the kinder stories. Is the maze also long gone? she asked. No such luck, he replied. Even without me spyglass in hand, I can see the labyrinth has grown taller. It is a place I dare not enter, for here there be monsters. Soon the Hornswaggle was hovering over golden sands, sparkling with tiny shells and bits of sea glass. Captain Tom led George and Tanith down into the bilge, where a trapdoor opened, depositing them onto the shore as easily as they had been swept up into the ship. He accompanied them as far as the lush wall of shrubbery that blocked their view of anything beyond the beach. His phoenix sang in response to bird calls and hoots echoing out of the bushes. Take this, Mitties, Captain Tom said, and knelt down to hang something around Tanith's neck. This here be the labyrinth protecting the red dragon's keep. Somewhere in its depths is the entrance to Pangborn's cave, where he sleeps with his horde. We have not seen him these past few days, which means he is asleep and due to wake up, to return to his hunt for any man named George. My master is the last George, said the dog. I intend to save him by any means necessary, even if I must slay the dragon. Lord Pangborn is old and wise, said the baby drake. I intend to become his student when you fail to slay him. Captain Tom listened, and his kind eyes held a mixture of concern and hope. You're a good boy, George, and Tanith is a fine youngling, he said, giving their ears a good scratch. Fare thee well, and good luck on your treasure hunt. The traveling companions watched Captain Tom return to the ship. He was lifted into the trapdoor, which closed seamlessly, leaving only the perfect blue hull. Buccaneers lined up along the parapet to wave goodbye. Then the hornswaggle rose into the air until it was all but invisible against the sky. It flew so high they could not see the rainbow balloons anymore, but a hint of music on the wind lingered in their ears. Already the temperature was hotter, the cool breaths coming off the spring lakes far behind them across the sea. They ran up the beach, their claws digging in, and bounded through a gap in the trees, marking the entrance to the labyrinth. Immediately, Tanith's bright green scales turned apple red, as bright as the trumpet vines winding their way through the leaves on either side of the sandy path. Hummingbirds whizzed past their noses in search of hibiscus blossoms, while louder varieties like toucans and parakeets chattered overhead, arguing with a few rogue seagulls. The hedges of the maze towered above, taller than the hull of the hornswaggle so recently left behind. After running in the fragrant summer air for some time, the pair stopped to have a look around. George panted till his tongue dripped. Now we must find our way through to Pangborn's cave, he said. Would you be so kind as to point the way, my friend? I would be happy to, she answered. Tanith grasped the compass with her paw and studied Captain Tom's gift carefully. The two of them stood at a crossroads with three choices, left, right, and back the way they came. Lizards skittered from bush to bush while hornets, stick bugs, and mantises ignored the newcomers on their way elsewhere. The little dragon carefully stepped over a trail of ants as she followed the compass down the path to their right. Deeper and deeper into the maze, 
George and Tanith began to lose their sense of direction. Only the compass made it possible to know which way was the beach they started from, and which way it would take them into the heart of the labyrinth where they presumed the dragons keep to be. They did not know for sure if they would have to cross the whole winding country to find it, or if it sat in the middle like the eye of a storm. The scenery became ever more disorienting. Every turn in the path took them down yet another leafy corridor, all the same, yet always different. When they came across a pool with a lion-headed fountain, the pair lay down to rest, eat, and drink, only to find a near-identical one a few turns later. George sniffed the air to check for any sign of themselves, while Tanith examined the stone lion in search of unique lichen and cracks. Sometimes it was a new fountain, and sometimes they were walking in circles. When the sun was directly overhead, the heat forced George and Tanith to get as far under a bush as they could to stay cool. Otherwise, their eyes swam with colors, blinded by lilies, plumeria, and bird-of-paradise blooms. They walked into palm fronds, they stumbled over tortoises, they were startled by anything that moved, be it monkey, frog, or cougar slipping out of sight. There was an abundance of life here to distract predators who might otherwise stalk strangers, but the traveling pair only felt safe when they found water and regained their sanity. Getting up to walk was disheartening, for it meant navigating more dead ends and spiraling paths that the compass could not predict. The height of the hedges made it impossible to keep going after the sun dipped too close to the horizon. Long shadows dazed their eyes as thoroughly as bright flowers. They came across a large open area, much like the grounds of a palace, and collapsed for the night. They paused to shirk their knapsack and unicorn horn before falling fast asleep. The grassy plaza had soft grass and was filled with trimmed shrubs, trickling fountains, and statues. Only in the morning were the dog and the drake able to have a proper look around. Suddenly, they heard great stomping footsteps coming down the path. George and Tanith quickly hid themselves behind the marble statue of a sphinx to see who it was. Out into the park walked the most unusual creature either of them had ever seen. He had the body of a man, many times taller than average, with broad shoulders, and the head of a bull. Everything from his muzzle to his hooved feet was covered in silky black fur. Only his enormous curved horns were ivory in color. Everything he wore was made of gold, including his nose ring. I know you are there, called the Minotaur. You cannot hide from me in the labyrinth. Tanith was quick to duck down behind the statue, ready to think of an escape plan. So she was shocked to see George trot out to meet the guardian of the maze, as if safety were guaranteed. She was always amazed by her companion's ability to trust. Somehow he had a good sense for who would be kind and who to avoid. Unwilling to leave George behind, she followed him at a distance. What a good boy! The Minotaur exclaimed, bending down low to give the little dog a pat. How did you end up here? And with a baby dragon? Come, sit with me by the water. I will bring you something to eat as well. This was a great relief to the traveling companions, who had eaten most of their food, too delirious to ration it out, too unsure to dare eat anything they saw. They watched the Minotaur wander around the edge of the park, picking various fruits and vegetables off the hedge walls as he went. He returned with his arms full. These were laid out on the ground, and both dog and dragon tucked in with the promise that these mysterious delicacies were good for any stomach. Then the three went to the largest pool to watch the swan fountain shoot drops into the air that fell and created beautiful ripples. Small alligators reclined in a bed of river rocks. Every inch of the fountain was scrubbed clean, so the depths were clear as glass. George and Tanith made themselves comfortable on the lawn, while the Minotaur sat himself down on a bench carved with spiraling designs. Now, tell me everything, he said. You seem to have gotten here by wandering at random. We are searching for a dragon known to eat men named George, said the dog. A kindly pirate captain gave us a compass. How did you get here? The Minotaur was intrigued to hear this. A compass? he asked eagerly. Tanith reluctantly held out the precious object to show him. Captain Tom says Lord Pangborn shall wake up soon and begin his rampage again, she said. We must reach him soon, or we shall not have a chance to speak with him until he returns. 
Stroking his chin whiskers, the Minotaur considered this. I will make you a deal, he said at last. If you do not intend to come back through the labyrinth, if you expect either doom or triumph when you meet the dragon, then I will help you. In exchange for your compass, I shall lead you to the cave just in time. However, beware. I have seen many adventurers make it to the dragon's keep. There are a few who prevailed in their quest to face Pangborn the Red, and successfully died trying to slay him. But all the rest turned and fled at the mere sight of his talons. If you give me the compass, you will never find your way out. You will have no choice but to face him or perish in the labyrinth. Either way, you are lost. Huh?